Today I'm speaking with Dr. Eric Sherry. Dr. Sherry is a philosopher of science and a chemistry professor at UCLA. He is one of the founders of the philosophy of chemistry, a global authority on the history and philosophy of the periodic table, and in fact actually wrote the book on the periodic table. In this conversation, we discuss topics including reductionism, emergence, the possibility of silicon-based life forms existing in the universe, how artificial intelligence might affect the future of chemistry, and more philosophical topics such as Taoism, how the universe might be one, and how that idea is supported by modern science. This episode is representative of what the Elder Lama podcast is all about, so I'm really excited for you to hear it. Speaking with Dr. Sherry was an absolute privilege. I mean, this guy is at the forefront of humanity's understanding of the chemistry of this universe. And not only did we get to talk about science, we also got to go deeper into our philosophies of how the world works. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Eric Sherry. You're listening to the Elder Llama Podcast, the show that inspires curious minds to ponder the secrets of the universe. My name is Eric Amezqua. I'm a UCLA undergrad STEM major, and in this podcast, I combine my knowledge of astrophysics, evolutionary biology, and the nature of the human mind to make cohesive observations about the world. I'm here with Dr. Eric Sherry. Professor, thank you for joining me. You're welcome. Looking forward to it. Awesome. So you are a philosopher of science, a chemist, and really kind of a global authority on the periodic table. So maybe we can start off by uh, you summarizing what it is that you do professionally at the moment. Okay. Well, I, as you indicated, I wear many hats. I am one of the founders of the study of the history and philosophy of chemistry, especially the philosophy of chemistry. History of chemistry has been around for a long time, but Philosophy of chemistry was a neglected field for many years. Uh, philosophers of science tended to concentrate on physics, which is the most fundamental of the sciences. And when they realized they were almost exclusively only looking at physics, they went to the other end of the spectrum and they developed a philosophy of biology. Chemistry sits somewhere in the middle of that spectrum of the sciences. And uh, for some odd reason, they leapfrogged completely over chemistry and went to biology. I mean, there are reasons. Biology is clearly not reducible to physics, right? You can't, you can't explain life by going to fundamental physics. So there are good reasons why it required a new philosophy of biology. Chemistry is closer to physics, and there's the popular perception that physics does explain all of chemistry. So one of the questions in the relatively new philosophy of chemistry is to examine to what extent does fundamental physics explain all of chemistry. I what see I that. also do is, as, I, as you know, having been one of my students at UCLA, I teach chemistry at UCLA, and I write books on such things as the periodic table, the chemical elements, and on philosophy of science in general. A lot to cover there, and I think those are all things that uh, I hope to touch on within the hour. But first, about your book, uh, as I understand, you wrote what is widely known or widely accepted to be the book on the periodic table titled The Periodic Table, Its Story, and Its Significance. And so in my show, whenever I can justifiably bring up aliens, I will do so invariably. Okay, so in the introduction to your book, the first paragraph is a quote by J. Emsley that really hit home for me. It was something along the lines of, if we were to communicate with a distant part of the universe, uh, with another civilization, and even if our cultures were totally distinct, there would be one thing we have in common. And that is a concise organization of the elements of the universe. Right? So I wonder... What role does the universality of chemistry play in your passion for the periodic table? Um, be before answering that, let me let me ask, answer a question I thought you were going to ask. Okay, <laughs> which was, do you agree with that quotation? 
Um, I'm not sure I do entirely, even though, I, as you said, I begin the book with that because it's, it's a fairly dramatic statement. It gives an indication of how important the periodic table is. In other words, even other civilizations would have to agree on the periodic table, if nothing else. I'm not, I'm not so sure. I think that's rather presumptuous of us to imagine that we have hit on such fundamental rock bottom truths as the periodic table, for instance. Mm. So I, would, I would moderate that statement to that. Okay, how would you, uh, what would you tweak in it? Well, I would also, first of all, I would generalize it and say it's one of the things that another civilization might agree on. Uh, other things might be the speed of light, um, you know, the knowledge of the structure of the atom or something yes. like that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't restrict it to just the periodic table. So I think my, my friend John Emsley has gone a little bit over the top in, in mm. making that claim. Yeah, I see that. Perhaps that, that is, I see that. Uh, and before you enter the second part, uh, I guess I, I'll touch on that as well. Um, I do think that, well, we we occupy the same universe, and thus, if they are sufficiently advanced, they might have discovered, you know, the hydrogen atom, helium atom. But I guess if they had, if if they're at a certain level of of technology, I feel like. Uh, they would have discovered those similar elements, right? Because those are universal elements. Um, but perhaps it's organized in a different way. It it's, doesn't have to be uh, in a periodic table. That's a very, could be a human thing, you know? Exactly, exactly. I, th I think they may have, they may well have found a much better way of organizing the elements. They may have found other elements. It, it's presumptuous of us to think that we, we really know the what the elements are for the whole universe, never mind how to classify them. Mm. Yeah. I, you know, what am I trying to say here? In in all such, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit like, you know, Europeans at one time thinking that that's all there was to civilization and not believing it possible that there were other civilizations on other continents. It's a right. little bit like that with humans on the earth and possible civilizations out there. We have no idea what, what exists out there. Yes. As far as we currently know, there's nothing else. But you know, as you know, so many exoplanets have been discovered now and that they seem to exist in just the right conditions to mimic the earth's conditions. So if, if, if it, what it takes is the right temperature and the right pressure and so on, well, there are now planets that are like that. And only, only about, I, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, the official view was that there are no other planets other than the ones in the solar system, which I, I always found to be a ridiculous claim. Why? Why do we think that we are the only system that has planets? I mean, it, it, it struck me as absurd. Equally absurd is the idea to me that there are no other civilizations out there, that we, we are the, the top dog. Yes, I think that's a common theme of humanity is this human hubris. We see it time and time again. It's like the, we have dis, we have finished physics in you know, the early 1900s. We have learned everything there is to know about physics. In 10 years, we will be done. And then, oh no, here comes quantum mechanics and it totally, in rel relativity, it totally shatters the world, right? What was that? That was the ultraviolet or the, um, the catastrophe. What was that called again? The ultraviolet catastrophe. Ultraviolet catastrophe. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think the the chances that we are the only ones are very slim. And the trend is we think we have, you know, we are the center of the solar system. That's wrong. We are the center of the universe. That, that's clearly wrong. Th there's this trend of think, feeling that we are at the top and that we are, we have found fundamental truths and more discoveries come, and that paradigm's shattered. So I, I think that will also apply to um, the idea that we are the only civilization. Okay, so moving on to that that second part of the question was, um, I I'm curious to see how did this kind of thinking shape your career, like your early career as a an undergrad, as a grad student. Uh, you wanted to study the periodic table. How did this 
universality of science fit into your passion? Um, well, I'm not sure that it did. I think, I mean, the reason I wanted to study the periodic table was because I was so taken by it. It, I like order, I like classification, and this is the ultimate system of classification. It, I mean, classifies everything there is, or at least everything we, going back to the previous theme, everything that we know that there is. Um, my reason for studying chemistry was just that I was better at chemistry than I was at, at say, physics or other other disciplines. I was I was just taken by chemistry. Now, whether that's because of the universality of it, yeah, maybe. Maybe certainly the reason for going into the sciences as opposed to the humanities was because it was more challenging in the sciences, that is, and one had the feeling of this was real knowledge compared to the kind of information rather than knowledge that, that exists in other fields. In other fields, things come and go. I mean, my favorite example might be political systems. At the moment, we have capitalism, we have communism in certain countries, we have all these isms, but they, they come and go. There's no, they don't last. It's not true knowledge. It's somebody's idea which people glom onto and and, and make do with for a while. So that is the essential difference between science and non-science, something that is, a, of course, a, a big issue in the philosophy of science. One question in the philosophy of science has been, how can we demarcate between science and non-science? The most um, famous uh, person to, to expound on that theme is the philosopher Karl Popper. And Karl Popper had a very simple and elegant solution. If it's not refutable, it's not scientific. And that still holds today. I, I've definitely learned that. Yeah, I didn't learn it from Popper, but I definitely heard that. Yeah, it's, it seems that science is the way by which we discover truth. And I think the power of it is that, as you say, as I've heard you say before, that it has built into it, it allows itself to be wrong and to, to question itself and to further improve until we reach those rock bottom truths. And I feel like that is also what, for me, the reason I asked that question is because as a student, the universality of science is what really drives me. Like I took your 14B class. The reason I am so excited about it is not because, not because I want to get an A per se. It's because what I'm learning, thermodynamics, uh, PV equals NRT, the ideal gas, all like these are things that describe the distant universe and for me that is an infinitely greater incentive than a grading system uh unfortunately i feel like a lot of my peers a lot of students today they kind of have fallen into uh that illusion that learning is a means to an end it is you learn so you can pass a test or you can get a certain gpa or grade uh and that's i've certainly seen that in my three years at UCLA, how do how do you? I'm curious to see how you see that as like being on the other side as a professor, some the the person teaching these students. Okay, well, I'm I'm gratified when I hear of a student that thinks in that way because, as you say, especially in a highly competitive school like UCLA, most students are there. They're highly driven, or they're being driven by their parents to achieve certain grades in order to then go into medicine or dentistry or what have you. And so they, they almost can't afford to get interested in the material because they've got to go on to the next exam and cramming for the next course, which is a, which is a pity. And my, I mean, my advice to people is always follow what you're passionate about. Don't follow something that you think will get you a, a more high paying career or a or a more conventionally accepted career. Yes. Yeah, it does seem like a, a shame, you know, to be at a top school uh, like UCLA. It's such a privilege to be here. And I, my first year, like the one thing they told me, and I think they tell everyone in orientation is, oh, you were valedictorian in your high school? Oh, everyone's valedictorian here. Um, you're an average. And I feel like, they instill in the first day the these limiting beliefs that 
you you are a little fish in a big pond, but you still have the potential to thrive. Like you have something to offer and you're, you you have access to people such as yourself, the top scientists, the top philosophers in their fields. And that's just such a privilege. The, okay, so, I, go ahead. Just a brief comment on that. Yes. I mean, I, I can see why you would be given that advice that, you know, you, you may have been the top person in your high school, but, you know, be be aware of the fact that nearly all the students here are going to be in that situation. I think it's it's just to warn people not to be too shocked mm. by the competition that they are suddenly going to be confronted with on moving from high school to college. So, I see that perspective. I mean, it's it's reasonable advice. I don't think that's intended to to put anyone off getting interested in on, on the country. It's meant... I mean, it could be taken to mean the opposite. It means if you if you're going to continue to do well, you've really got to get into this stuff. Yes, I I see that perspective. I haven't hadn't explored that one. Uh, my personal experience was that in my first year, I definitely I tried, but it, I didn't try as if I had the chance to be a top student. And it was like that for a few quarters, but it was it, it wasn't until my second year where I got really good grades one quarter and I was like, wow, I can, I'm capable of this. And for me, it was that belief that I have the chance to do this that really ma- changed my academic career. I'd like to uh, kind of shift gears, going back to something you said uh, at the outset of this, which was that physics bi- or science builds on itself. We go from mathematics to physics, chemistry, biology, social sciences, and from top down, sciences reduce into each other until you get to the bedrock. Why is it that you, physics can describe chemistry and chemistry can kind of get into molecular biology, but d- does it stop there? Does science stop uh, explaining the the next emergent layers? No, I don't think so. I think it's a continuous spectrum. Uh, physics explains chemistry, broadly speaking. Of course, this is debated whether whether reduction succeeds entirely. But of course, broadly speaking, it does. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the success we have. Part of the success of science has been reductionism. The more you break things up into small pieces and study the pieces, the more you can understand the bigger system. And so it follows that chemistry, which deals with reasonably large systems, you know, let's say atoms and molecules, is going to be understood better by studying the more fundamental components like electrons, protons, neutrons to some extent, and and even lower. So I don't think there's a debate as to whether reductionism works in, in broad terms, except, well, having said, there is a kind of a debate. The debate is whether, whether you find out useful things by breaking it up into its smaller components and studying the components, whether you find out whether you're missing something. Right? The view of the other people, should we say, the, the critics of reductionism, their view is that you're missing something, that you're missing something, let's say, of the human being by reducing the human being to all its organs and nerves and bones mm-hmm. And you know the, the the medical aspects, and sure enough, you know we we know that if you go to a doctor complaining about something, the doctor is really only able to deal with prescribing certain drugs for the condition and quickly trying to arrive at what specific condition the person has, and not treating let's say the whole person. So that's the that's the other side. I, I, don't, I don't know if I've answered your question. In fact, I've forgotten what the question even is. No, about. that's okay. It, it's, it's definitely inspired a, a more clear question in my head. Uh, just to touch on what you said, it seems like we have the, these fundamental laws of nature and the way our universe works. And as we go up, uh, let's say, let's call it the scale of complexity, we yeah. get to things like ecology and sociology, the yeah. behavior of organisms. And yeah. all these things, they are in the same universe and they're subject to the same 
laws of nature. Yeah. What is different about them that makes it so difficult to create uh, theories and and be able to really understand it? Well, the, it would, it's almost as if different laws, different explanations apply at different levels. And so if you're going to try and explain chemistry, in addition to having this knowledge from the fundamental science of physics, we're going to need laws and models and theories that apply at that grosser level than physics. And yes. that's appropriate because it's almost like saying, you know, if you want to study the the movement of a train, you're not really going to get into the movement of atoms and electrons and so on. You want to study the laws of classical mechanics, the laws of large objects in motion. There are these sort of emergent properties that come with that increase in complexity. Like if you wanted to study a society, you cannot break it down to one individual because by doing so, by definition, you're no longer looking at a society. Good. It seems yeah, like a good way to put it. Yeah. A society is the emergent property of a bunch of individuals. And maybe uh, that is why people argue that by reducing these these fields of study to just the basics, you're losing something. And I think it is those emergent properties. Okay. Okay. Except, except that the... Uh, I mean, that brings up a whole other discussion about whether emergent properties are real. I, I mean, in broad terms, I agree with you. But then it's, it's, been, it's been quite difficult to try and really characterize emergence. For instance, it appears as if chemistry emerges from physics. So it appears as if chemistry has something over and above the physical components. And yet, nobody, to my knowledge, has been able to characterize or capture what it is that constitutes emergence. You can't quantify it. You can't, you can't get at it. Except in, a, in, in the very broad ways we've been doing by saying, well, you need the appropriate laws for appropriate levels, M meaning there are, you know, there are laws in chemistry, say, uh, PV equals NRT might be one, although that's, that's really more physics. Um, well, the periodic law, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a law that relates to the elements. It's, a, it's essentially a chemical law. Is that an emergent phenomenon over and above the, the physics of the atoms and the individual elements? Not clear that it is. Mm. Interesting. Okay, so I guess now, now that we're in the realm of the periodic table or periods, uh, to my understanding... The reason carbon is such a such a f foundational uh, element of life is because it can make so many bonds, right? It has four valence electrons, and it can bond with a lot of things. So this is a question that somebody sent me. Is it possible that there, there, there exists life that is not carbon-based, that is instead like silicon-based or germanium? Um, these are elements in that same group that have the same number of valence electrons. Yeah, it's possible. Anything's possible. Under different conditions, it may be that silicon can also form uh, many long chain molecules. I mean, it, the fact that carbon works so well on the earth isn't just that it forms four bonds, because as you've said, many elements in that, or all the elements in that group have the potential to form four bonds. It's, it's really the variety of compounds that can form through chain forming, through multiple bond formation, um, through branching of chains. Now, it's conceivable that under different conditions, silicon, the next element down after below carbon, could do as well, if not better. What are those conditions that you, you're talking about? Well, I, I don't know. I'm speculating now because you're, you're talking about on other in other realms, in other other parts of the universe, mm. it it may be, uh, let's say, high pressure, for example. High pressure may allow silicon to do something that it does not do on Earth. Yes, and th there's no telling what how what this could affect. 
like everything that we are, the way we think, the way we going back to the periodic table, the way we organize the periodic table, it's all, they're all little variables that are fundamentally based on a carbon based organism. So when we, when we try to make uh, these fundamental truths, you know, like, did we discover all of the elements of the universe? It's, it is going back to the Hubris thing. It's a grand claim. There is just so much diversity that could exist out there in the universe. Yeah. One more comment on carbon. I think carbon, in a way, it so happens that nature has chosen carbon because carbon is the best at doing this building of molecules and, and complex molecules. You know, if you're going to have complexity, li living systems are incredibly complex, even the simplest ones. They're going to need molecules that are able to have complicated molecules so that they can conduct all the complicated mechanisms that are involved in living systems. And it so happens that carbon does that best of all on the Earth. Okay. We've discussed artificial intelligence uh in the past after after class with a few other students i believe and um one thing i would like to revisit is how how do you see artificial intelligence affecting the field of chemistry in the next couple of decades uh and more broadly science as a whole okay now that's that's an interesting not not that the other questions haven't been interesting but th this is a very interesting question and a newer one, of course, than these the ones about it, reduction in emergence. Um, I like to think of it like this. The, it used to be a challenge for artificial intelligence to be able to beat the best grandmasters at chess. These days, it's easy. The computer wins every time, every time, not just sometimes. They've even, the computers have now even been able to, be, to beat the best players in the world at the game of Go something we've discussed before. So where is this heading and, and what about the influence on science? It means that problems that would traditionally have been solved by number crunching and so on can be done much, much more easily. For example, there was an article that appeared just a couple of weeks ago about a new way of classifying the elements, which looked at the similarity between all the elements and ranked them in order of similarity. And by doing that, you could make compounds which might have better properties, might have as yet unknown properties. And there's no doubt that artificial intelligence will achieve that. It will give us, for instance, better materials. But it won't give us an understanding of what's going on. In other words, it's like taking a sledgehammer to crack a nut. It will crack the nuts but it will not give us an understanding. For instance, as far as I know, I may be wrong, artificial intelligence in chess doesn't allow the chess players to play better chess. I mean, we don't learn from the machines. The machines go ahead and do the task. I may be wrong. It, mm. it may be, and I, and I have heard, for instance, in the game of Go, that some professional Go players have now, are now trying to develop a new approach to the game because of what they've seen. That, but barring that, my general comment is, yes, of course, it will affect the field. Yes, we will make discoveries that would take, it's a little bit, it's a, it's a little bit like how the computer has affected things. The, the, the arrival of the computer has made things possible, for instance, predicting the weather in a way that wasn't possible before. We still can't really, really predict the weather, but we can do a hell of a lot better than we could, let's say, 40, 50 years ago. So it's a similar leap from regular computing to artificial intelligence, which, of course, learns by its mistakes and learns very quickly. Um, yeah, so yes, extremely powerful. Who's to say where it will it will take us? But I have a slight reservation about does it help us to understand? So something I kind of am picking up on that's kind of underlying your comment is the idea that 
this artificial intelligence will be operating on s- such a high level of let's call it cognition that even though it can find these patterns with the elements and uh solve these these games it's it's on such a different level that it cannot bring that down to human understanding and that that's a limitation that simply cannot be surpassed i guess it kind of it goes back again to the hubris of man that we think we are such intelligent beings but the capacity that other beings other uh, other organisms or in this case of ai other creations machines mm. have for thinking is just unfathomable well that that's a more positive view than than what i just expressed maybe you're right i'm not saying you but that's a more positive view you're saying it's hubris on the part of humans to think that these machines are somehow inferior but i'm saying that in a sense they are somehow inferior because they they can't be creative they just do what they're told they do what they're told far 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 better than a human can by just sheer trial and error by spanning the huge space of possibilities in a matter of instance yes they can do that but they can't be creative is that a is that the case for I, that is definitely the case for right now the current state of our technology do you think it will be so forever i don't that i simply don't know okay for the machine to make the leap into creativity genuine creativity um i can't see it but then nor could i see the the discovery of exoplanets by the dozens and hundreds by i believe there are hundreds of exoplanets by by now the discovery of exoplanets really struck me when it when it happened because so many times you would read in books that there just are no other planets and yet here they are so i'm not going to be i'm not going to express strong views on such things as whether artificial intelligence will eventually be capable of create genuine creativity maybe maybe mm Okay, I think that that closes that loop. Uh I know you're on a time crunch, so I do want to get to some of the things I wrote down. I I think this was week 3, week 4 of fall 2020, uh last quarter. You briefly mentioned that you believe that everything in the universe is one. Mm-hmm. And I I'd like for you to talk talk a little bit about that. Okay. Well, now now we now we're getting into philosophy as opposed to philosophy of science. <clears throat> and and actually beyond philosophy because funny enough philosophy doesn't really broach this question very much this is something that is is a sort of lifelong interest of mine or let's say since i was in my early 20s and it's more in the realm of mysticism um what should we say that that sort of area philosophy of life as opposed to philosophy in a, in an academic sense and i latched on in my early 20s to chinese philosophy and eastern philosophy in general and i found that and as were many people at the time um it was a time of experimentation and it was a time when people were looking beyond western culture and and one of the things that was on offer should we say was eastern philosophy and and to me that that turned me around because it it answered the questions i had about life that for example religion was not explaining to me i happen to have been brought up in the catholic religion uh but i think any religion any conventional religion fails to answer the really deep questions now it's it so happens that eastern philosophy not eastern religion necessarily the east they're sometimes called eastern world views like like the the dao spelled t a o but pronounced dao i'm told or or zen these philosophical world views really aim to get at the heart of things and according to those philosophical world views the world is essentially one completely unified I think I may I don't know if I did mention this to you the only western philosopher that I'm aware 
of that gets at this is a philosopher called Spinoza, who lived in the 1700s, I believe. He worked in Amsterdam. Yeah, we talked about him. Right. He somehow, um, I don't know if people have tried to look into whether he had any contact with Eastern philosophy. I doubt it. He, he arrived at the same view, that everything is essentially one. To me, that's a comfortable view. Because, you know, what happens to us after we die? Well, we die, but the, the, the universe lives on. Why... What are we even doing here? Well, the, the, the view from these Eastern philosophies is, is almost as if we come out of the one temporarily, we live for 80-something years if we're lucky, and then we go back in. Or The one is the only thing that survives. And so essentially, essentially, we are. We are one, or we are, we are part of that unity of everything, which goes all the way to the extremities of the universe, not just on the earth. It's, to me, a more comforting view than, than the traditional religious view. So at that point, I pretty much, or even earlier, actually, because religion didn't talk to me, I abandoned conventional religion. And, and looked more to the scientific worldview because the scientific worldview also speaks in terms of unity. That most of the important discoveries have had to do with unification of the strong force, the weak force, the electromagnetic force, the unification of space and time by Einstein, and so on. So it, it appears that science is on that track as well. In fact, at the time when I was getting interested in this, there were some books that were coming out that were pointing out the parallels between Eastern philosophy and modern science, especially modern physics. One of those books is, is a, a very well-known book. It's called The Tao of Physics. And if you haven't read it, I would recommend having a look at that. The author is Fritjof Capra. Okay, noted. So that's a very long digression in, in trying to answer your question. And again, I've forgotten what the question actually was, but it... Uh, it's it sent me on that long journey. <laughs> well, you, you seem to have remembered part of you remembered it because it was just more than I was looking for. It was perfect. Uh, I I am I so agree with you. Like it, it's it's so comforting and inspiring to see that the I, I feel like I've come to a very similar conclusion, and to see that you have also explored that is uh, it's just awesome. Um, towards the end, you kind of hinted that. This idea that everything is one, that we are one, is not incompatible with modern science. Right. And here is where my brief dabbling in astrophysics comes in. If we look at the history of the universe, we see that the universe started as this infinitely small region of space-time. And it, it, for lack of a better word, exploded with the magnitude of all of the energy in the universe. Over time, this this universe expanded, cooled, and these massive conglomerations of matter that we call stars formed. Hydrogen was the only element that existed. But within the, these stars, being under so much heat and pressure, hydrogen was able to fuse into more elements, the elements that we are, that we know today. And more time passed, these stars, they appeared and they died. And they, they, they're, when they exploded, their chemically enriched innards were strewn throughout the cosmos. And on some planets, namely Earth that we know of, the perfect combination of energy, liquid water, and these elements was present such that through the laws of nature, these elements could become more and more complex. By some mechanism that we, that, that we don't understand, these molecules, organic molecules mingling in the depths of Earth's oceans 4.5 billion years ago, they sprung to the life, the first prokaryote. The first prokaryote. Then, then these became increasingly complex. We had eukaryotes, eventually multicellular organisms, eventually social beings like primates and and of course, all the all the the animals and plants we see today. 
we follow that that timeline, eventually you get thinking beings, you get humans, and it is as if like us talking about this right now, we are carbon based life forms. We are made of the oxygen, the nitrogen, the carbon, the phosphorus of the universe. It's as if this universe has come alive and it is looking in on itself for this brief 86 years, as, as you say, a being, a human being, a, a, a consciousness, a mind arises from this physical universe to experience itself. The universe experiences itself and then falls back into the energy systems. That's a powerful philosophy. Very good. You should write. I think you should write bo books or at least articles to begin with. But uh, that, that, that was well said. I think uh, on, a, on a smaller scale, you've, gi you've given us the sort of the cosmic view starting with the Big Bang. But on a more local level, I think the theory of evolution is perhaps the discovery of that, of that mechanism is, is probably the, the most important discovery of the 20th century. Because right there was the realization that we humans are not that distinct from, from animals, as we'd been given to believe by various religions and systems of thinking, that we were somehow, and again, it's hubris. You know, it's this idea of we, we, we are better than others. We're better than other beings. We are nothing but animals. However much some people reject that view, we are nothing but animals. That's not to say animals is a bad thing, but we, we are one with the, with the animal kingdom. We may be the most advanced form. Who knows? Who really knows? But that's, that's a separate discussion. But the fact that we, are, we came out of that lineage is so important. And the fact that so many people want to deny that in modern society, I mean, in, in, in the United States, the most advanced country in the world, there's so much denial of evolution. It's in many cultures, not just the US, but one would think that in, in a more advanced country, there would be more acceptance of it. But of course, we've seen, especially recently, the denial of science on all kinds of levels, not just evolution. Yes, and I've heard you posit that the theory of evolution is the single greatest discovery of mankind. And I think, I, I, I don't see an argument against it, personally. I think that is absolutely the case. It seems like that is the point at which this idea that we proposed just now, that idea of, of unity, it seems like at that point, that was possible because before then it was the universe. It was uh, other animals and this separate entity called humans placed here by some other being, right? This duality of mm. humans and everything else. The uh, origin of species is when we kind of erase that, that distinction. And it's like unity is, is, a, is a, um, an acceptable answer now. Yeah. Yeah. And yet it is not stressed by modern religions very much. There's there's all sorts of codes of behavior and and details and paraphernalia and ceremonies and whatnot. And there's no um, emphasis on unity. And we see the results. We see the results such as um, suspicion of, of other cultures and so on yes the, there is the uh the disunity with with those um i think founding your philosophy of the world in science is very powerful because as we as we established earlier science is our means of finding truth and it is dogma -less. It doesn't stick to beliefs. It, it, it challenges itself. And to be able to build your philosophy based on that, that's a powerful way. Um, yeah. Religion, as it seems, it seems like with those dogmas and the, the paraf paraphernalia, as you said, uh, comes egoism and tribalism and a bunch of things that 
I think it, it seems like unity is the medicine for. Yeah, and and it, what also comes is separation of we are the saved ones and those people have got it wrong somehow. They've got the wrong interpretation of this or that book or whatever it is. Sure. Yeah, yeah. so it actually it, it ends up serving to separate rather than to unify. Now, one one further point on that, that in the in the Eastern traditions, it's not just a talk of unity, but there are techniques for culturing unity within a human being. Those techniques involve such things as meditation and yoga. Um, I am a, pract a, a practitioner. I'm, I've been a meditator for many, many years. And I believe that that is... I mean, it's not a dogma. There's no system of beliefs. It's it's simply a practice that gives me a little, little sense of that unity on a daily level. So even if I don't think, you know, in the course of a day, oh, I am one with everything, because there's no, there's, you know, as much as one says that, if you don't feel one with everything, you're just not one with everything. Whereas something like meditation or yoga does actually instill that into a human being. It's an experience that through very really not really mini, minimal effort you can achieve you can you can find that experience of unity right so do you do you practice something like that what, yes what i your... I've been meditating for about two years um and I think it's aspects of Zen um what today people call mindfulness I see good yes and it, with just kind of observing the, this is kind of my uh, practice, I guess you can start by observing your feelings and ex observing sensation and eventually bring in more complex things like emotions and yet more complex things like thoughts. You see yourself, you, you are the observer of those things. And after a while, you can kind of get the insight that there is something more fundamental than those fleeting thoughts. And it is your awareness. You are yeah. not your thoughts. You're not the emotions, the feelings, the sensations. You are this fundamental awareness, this consciousness within you. And this awareness has no identity or separateness. It is, it is just, it is, that's it. And uh, what what is your practice? Uh, transcendental meditation, which was taught by a man called Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who passed away a few years ago. Um, it just happened to be the most popular med form of meditation when I was getting interested in these things. Um, it's it exists throughout the world. Um, um, and I would recommend it to, to anyone. Yes. I think it's a, it's a powerful supplement to being, being a better human. You know, if you can get the insight that you are, your identity doesn't, it's kind of an illusion. That's the identity of self is an illusion and get that daily insight of unity. You're just a naturally more compassionate person. Mm -hmm. One other practice like that, it's like my principal one is deep breathing there's this uh there's this dutch man named wim hof who talks about cold exposure and deep breathing so this year actually i've been doing cold showers every day uh so i'm almost done with that i'm gonna have a warm shower january 1st absolutely but this deep breathing method it's a very powerful technique um i took some physiology courses ls7c and I learned what was actually going on in the breathing before I would just do it. But now I see that these mental states that you can get to, the, these spaces of mind that are very peaceful, I think they are the result of optimizing your physiology. When you breathe, it's like huge breaths, like... The exercise is 30 of those and then releasing and just relaxing three times. Uh, when you breathe like that, what you're doing is exhaling all of the waste product of cellular respiration, all of the CO2 in your blood. And the pH of your blood actually rises a little bit. 
you get a little more alkaline, like 7.3, 7.4 pH. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, your, your blood's getting full of oxygen, such that when you release the breath, you can totally relax without the need to breathe. And you'll find you can be here for like one to two minutes. It's very powerful. So as I learned in the science, when there is no acidity in the blood, the brainstem doesn't give the body the the call to breathe. You don't feel the urge to breathe because there's no carbon. And so you don't you don't need to breathe. But in this, thoughts fall away and there is just really quite beautiful mental states. It's euphoria, bliss, peace. Please send me a, a, a link or something so I can look this up. I'd, I'd be interested in, in trying I it out. I absolutely will. Um, I think you'll you'll love it. It's it's been a it's really been a part of my life for about a year and a half now. And I that I mentioned the Joshua Tree trip. Most of this trip was just spent in meditation and in breathing and exercise. It was really to ground. I think this is a uh, fantastic place to finish it off. Do you have any last comments that you'd like to say? Um. Well, it's been it's been really quite interesting. I always knew you you were a very very interesting student. I mean the. I've, I've joked about the fact that you always brought up uh, aliens and things like that, which I, actually you didn't. But it's kind of interesting that we have now that the class has ended, we've been able to go into these more general areas and, and really deeper, deeper stuff. And then, you know, this seldom happens with uh, with students. So I'm uh, I'm happy to have done this. And, and maybe we should do do a repeat uh, performance sometime in the future. Well, I'm honored that you say that. Um, yeah, I definitely, definitely feels very natural. Uh, we really got into, like I said, deep, deep stuff. And I think we have a lot of similarities. Like your name's Eric. And we talked, we joked about this in the beginning of the quarter, but, um, I know you also play guitar and, uh, really, as we've just discovered our philosophy about how the world works is quite similar. Right. I didn't know you played guitar. Yeah, I do. I had the guitar in the background uh, during the lecture. All right. Well, sometime I'd, I'd like to hear you play. Sure. Last thing, much of my audience is students, um, people in my age group, people who like this talk, who like science, but at the same time, um, they explore spirituality and mind and ask these really deep philosophical questions. So... Do you have a message for them? Anything you'd like to say, lighthearted, deep, whatever it is, just kind of a message. I would say learn, learn to meditate. Very simple. It's not, I mean, it is deep because meditation is deep, but um, yeah. Yeah. Learn, learn to meditate. It'll, it'll do you good. Perfect. I wish I'd, I'd learned to meditate earlier than I did. I meditated after I had done, I was finished with my undergraduate course in uh, at the University of London. And I really did wish I'd started uh, before starting that course. And I, and I didn't. Okay. So you heard that guys. Um, try it out. If you need resources, I'm happy to be one. Uh, you know where to find me. Let me know. But Dr. Sherry, I really appreciate this conversation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Eric.